job too. And so let's welcome Brother David here and make sure he does feel welcome. Thank you, and I do appreciate being here with uh, you this morning. I appreciate Brother Don and the invitation that he's extended uh, to me and my family, and uh, I appreciate that very much. His hospitality has been wonderful. Uh, Kim kind of elbowed me there while he was introducing me, and she said, who's he talking about? Uh, uh, my bride of 17 years. Uh, we grew up in uh, this area, in this community, and went to college, and then uh, I pastored in London for a little while, and then moved back here, and we're glad to be back in, in home. And we, we love Rockcastle County. And I do appreciate this church and the stance that you took uh, in the wet drive vote and uh, helping uh, all of Rockcastle County. Um, I think that uh, along with your pastor, all of you supported it tremendously, and I, I loved being part of that because I felt like God was in it, and I was just glad to be able to be used by it. But I really do appreciate your support and your encouragement and also your support by being here this morning. Thank you very much. Revival is not about the evangelist. It's not about me. It's about you and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you have entrusted your heart, your soul, your life to him. And if you have not done so, if you are not absolutely 100% sure of that, then I hope that over the next few days, if not today, that you will come to know him as Lord and Savior because it is the greatest decision you will ever make. You must make that. Uh, an indecision is not possible. You either say yes or you say no to the Lord Jesus. And so I pray today you say absolutely, positively yes. This is the one time that I have encouraged people to say yes to a, a vote. Now, I, it's been a while since I've said yes. I always want, as preachers, you're wanting to preach and to encourage them to accept what you challenge them to do. Well, over the wet dry boat, I was having to change my vocabulary a little bit to saying vote no or say no, you know, that kind of thing. So that kind of confused me a little bit. But I'm glad to be back here today to tell you to say yes to Jesus. If you have your Bible, would you open it to Exodus, the fourth chapter? I will admit to you that I preach very nervous today with great anxiety. I don't preach today nervous because of where I'm at or who I am preaching to. I'm really not even nervous or anxious about the passage of Scripture that God has laid on my heart to share with you today, even though it is a little different maybe than what you might be used to. But my anxiety is to see what God is going to do as a result of this. This is a, a passage of scripture that is going to challenge our, our very thoughts. It's going to challenge our, our very lives. I've looked at this passage of scripture for many times. And this is one of those passages that, that just really captures me. Because there's so much about it that we really don't know. You know I believe in God's word that it is holy, infallible, it is inerrant. It is secure for all of eternity. You could burn up every Bible that's in the world, and God's word would still prevail, and it would still continue. And God has chosen to place a unique passage of Scripture here for us. And it's challenging. It's unique. It's interesting. And it's one of those that sometimes we'll just pass on by. It's one of those that sometimes, if you are a, a yearly Bible reader, and I hope that you are, maybe you read the Old Testament in a year and the New Testament in a year, maybe the whole Bible in a year, I hope you do that. And you know how sometimes when we get to those difficult passages of Scripture and we just think, what's that talking about? And then we move on. Well, this is one of those that really just grabbed me and said, uh, God, I, and I asked God, what are, you, what are you trying to say here? And so I preach a passage of Scripture to you not that I have conquered what this passage is talking about, but because I, I come humbly before it and I say, God, I, I need help. And I think that if every one of us that are here today will listen to this and say, God, what are you speaking to me? I think all of us will understand, God, I need to improve in this area. The title of the message today is A Bloody Lesson in Obedience. In Exodus chapter 4, God writes this in verse number 24. At a lot, and I read from the English Standard Version Bible. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him 
and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we come before you because we need help. We can't make it on our own in this world. We can't reach eternity with you by ourselves. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your power. We need your majesty. Father, today we in this place need your presence. That God, you would guide us to the cross. That you would guide our hearts to meeting with you here this day. Lord, I pray for every person that is here. That God, you would speak to them personally and individually. Challenge them of where they are at this very moment. And summons them to the place that they should be. Father, we pray your blessings on this word. May your word challenge us, move us even shape us and mold us into what you would have us to be. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a preacher that boldly declares 2 Timothy 3.16 that says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. But what happens in those difficult passages of scripture? What do we do with those? I was reminded of a story of a a girl in Sunday school class, she would read in Sunday school out of the Bible, as most Sunday schools do, and she would oftentimes get to those parts that are difficult to, to uh, say and some of the words that are difficult to pronounce, and as she would go across them, many times her, her teacher wouldn't recognize that she would get to that word and she would just say BHW and move right on. And so after two or three weeks of this young girl doing this, the teacher finally said, what are you saying? She said, well, I'm saying BHW. She said, what is that? She said, that means big hard word. <laughs> and probably most of us, we do the yearly Bible reading. We get to some of those and we BHW too. Uh, this passage of scripture, I'll be honest with you, is a, a difficult passage to preach. It's even a difficult passage to understand. And maybe we as adults today would say T-I-D-U. It's a text I, that's difficult to understand or I don't understand. The text is from Exodus chapter 4. It's an interesting part of the Bible because this is sort of the inauguration of Moses' leadership with uh, uh, the exile. This is the Exodus. This is God who is speaking to Moses and is challenging him, summoning him actually, to do a great and a mighty task. Now, Moses has had a, a history with God. Moses was a godly child. He was spared from death through, through uh, Pharaoh's edict. He was raised up by Pharaoh's daughter. He eventually became the, the prince of Egypt. And one day after uh, Moses got a little older as a young man, he saw a, a young Hebrew who was being abused by an Egyptian. And out of anger, Moses goes and he kills this Egyptian. And so fearing for his own life and fearing from uh, uh, the death of uh, Pharaoh, fearing that he would kill him, he decided it's time for me to flee. And so he runs out and he leaves. And he flees to Midian. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham through Couture. And so as he was out there and, and wandering, he met up with a guy named Jethro. Jethro had a daughter. And out of that good relationship that Moses and Jethro had, Jethro gave over to Moses his daughter Zipporah. And out of that then came two children, Gershom and Eliezer. And those two children were of Moses and Zipporah. And now as they enter in and God comes to speak to Moses and he comes to him to speak in a burning bush and not one that is being consumed, of course, but one that God is speaking out to Moses and is saying to him, listen, I've got a message for you. You've got to go back to Egypt. You've got to go back to Pharaoh and you've got to tell him, let my people go. 
And he's calling and he's summonsing Moses to do this very task. But you know where Moses is? He's in a place where in all likelihood he's forgotten all about Israel. Forty years has passed since this initial uh, leaving from, from uh, Egypt. Forty years has passed. Delivering God's people is probably just a, a distant memory. And then we have this passage of Scripture. It's one that almost fades into the pages if we're not careful. Before Moses can go and do this very task that God has set before him to go out and tell Pharaoh, say, listen, let my people go, he has to do something. And he reads and he brings to him this event. Now, I'll challenge you today. Take Exodus 4, 24. This probably isn't going to be a, a popular Father's Day passage. <laughs> this isn't a passage of Scripture that probably we don't take our children to to do a devotional at night. This is a, this is a tough passage. But are we permitted and allowed to skip over these passages that we don't understand? Or maybe those that become inconvenient to us and, and untimely? You see, the one very truth that I understand about God is that God doesn't play to our comfortability rules. It's not God's method to plan out and say, all right, all I want you to do is just to be as comfortable as you possibly can. What we have here is that God spares this little child, gives him over to the to Moses and Zipporah. And out of this, Moses was supposed to circumcise his, his young son. And he didn't. And so what we have is God is meeting here with Moses and is going to kill Moses. This is the man, the very man that God has said, you know what, you're going back to Pharaoh and you're going to tell my people, let them go. And now Mo uh, God has met with him and is just about to strike and to kill the very man that he is called to do this very task. And then we have this whole scene. Rather than killing Pharaoh, it's Moses' life who is in jeopardy. I agree, I understand that scholars divide on the issue as to who this he is that's going to be killed. Some say that it was Moses. Some say that it was the child. But I believe that every, every pronoun needs an antecedent noun. And so the son hasn't been named yet. And Moses has. Looks like to me, God's come to kill Moses. And then this interesting event occurs. Before I share with you three points that will help you to understand this passage, I want you to know that I understand who I'm talking to. I understand that there are many Christians that are here today, believers. And I understand that many of you hold positions within this church and probably have important roles within the community. This is a message for us. Moses is to be a leader. Believers are to be leaders. You and your church here as a deacon, as a trustee, as a Sunday school teacher, as an usher, as a secretary, as a treasurer, as a faithful member of this church, we have an obligation to obey God. This is the heart of the message right here. The humbling reality is this, that the call to, call to Christ requires a commitment to obedience and to his blood covenant. That's what we shared this morning. Let me quickly share with you three thoughts about this. Number one is that private obedience is worth more than public leadership. Private obedience is worth more than public leadership. Two events occur in Moses' life in his ministry that are strange and obscure. And, and this one is the beginning. Two of them bookend his life and in both of them I would have to say that he failed God in them. Both show that he isn't fit to lead. Both show that he really messed all these things up. God told him to speak to the rock and he struck the rock bookending the latter part of it. And now what we have is these two instances that bookend Moses' life, and he's failed in both of them. Both show that he isn't fit to lead until he knows what to do and how to live his life 
private. This is what Moses is trying to get at here. Now, I know maybe what you're thinking, well, Brother David, this is very small. This is insignificant. Okay, he forgot to circumcise his son. And instead of uh, uh, speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. And so all this thing, that's just minor. That's just small. But I tell you this. Before we can lead publicly, we've got to learn from God privately. God will use Moses in leadership, but only until he has surrendered to God's lordship. The same way it will occur with you. Between one's calling and accomplishments of success, there is a commitment to conformity and convictions from God. We must conform to his views, his standards, not our own, but to him. Let's face it. In many churches today, including mine and many others that I know about, we're struggling with obedience. We're, we're struggling with taking what, what is God's holy word and really ingesting it into our lives and really beginning to live by it. We read it as almost, it's a good history book. It's a good, good historical text. It's something that can tell us, or maybe we'll just get some good insightful knowledge from us that will help us for today. But I tell you what, this book it is much more than that. It's not just something that we just pick up casually and read for a bedtime story or something we just read at night hoping that we'll bore ourselves to sleep. This is the holy infallible word of God that must be accepted. It must be lived by every single day. This is what rules our life. I tell you, if we don't get back to the heart of obedience, we will never see revival. Most churches are, are the same. We've got disobedient people in the church. And that breaks my heart. We've got people that live by their own standards. Pick up a newspaper. Go out and talk in the towns. And, and you find out that in every city, in every place around America, we've got prominent leaders within the church that shack up. We've got prominent leaders that embezzle funds. We've got prominent leaders that gamble away their paychecks. And they all do it under the same smile, under the same guile of being in God's house. And they act as if nothing is wrong. They disobey God's word throughout the week. And then on Sunday, they appear like everything is all right. There's a problem. There's a big problem. The sins we hear about is not the root is not the sin, but the root of the sin is obedience. That's the real issue. If the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God, then the greatest sin has to be to fail at that area. And that's why I say to you that private obedience is worth more than public leadership. Is what they see on Sunday morning the same thing that they see on Friday night? A lady that I pastored not too long ago, we were having vacation Bible school. I saw her name signed up on the list that she was going to teach one of the classes. And I had just learned some information about her that she and her, what we thought is her husband, wasn't really married. They were just living together. They wore wedding bands. They wore rings. But they had never gone through the ceremony. They had never made and pledged their commitment to one another. And so now I had a, a situation on my hand. What was I going to do? Vacation Bible school leader is going to lead and teach children. And, and we're going to put her as an example of leadership before them. I had to make a decision. So before I went to the vac vacation Bible school director, I went to the lady. I said, listen. I've got a little bit of a problem. I understand that you and your husband are, are not married. She says, oh, so Brother David, don't worry about that. Nobody knows about it. I guess before I could catch myself, I sort of leaned in and almost lunged at her. And I said, but God does. God knows. And that's a problem. The standard is that you're, you should be married. 
That you should come together and not just live together, but be married by pledging your faith and your commitment to one another. I said, there's a big problem. She said, oh, if no one knows, it should be okay. I said, but God knows. Friends, we are living our lives every single day as if we're the only ones that know about it. We can hide it from God. God doesn't know. God doesn't see. He doesn't hear. But we can cover it up just like anything else. But I tell you this. You've got to be committed, committed to follow. And I'll say this much, you've got to convince me that if you can live in a life of rebellion, if you can live a life and still cling to your sin, then you're going to have a hard time convincing me that, that you're saved. Where's your heart today? If you are clinging to sin and saying, that's no big deal, if you are, are holding on to and saying, that sin's all right, no one else knows about it, if you can say that, there's a problem. The second thing I want you to understand today from this passage is that submission to your father is worth more than the support of your family. Submission to the heavenly father is worth more than the support of your family. One thing it becomes very difficult as pastoring. Brother Don can, I'm sure, attest to this. Is that sometimes our families don't always understand. Now, I'm not speaking about my wife, but sometimes my extended family in general. They don't understand why you have to do the things you have to do. They don't understand why you have to say the things you have to say. But you know, this one thing is interesting here. Is that Zipporah isn't really mentioned much by Moses. It's kind of strange that he doesn't mention his wife. I've been here five or ten minutes, and I've already told you about my wife. Zipporah, I mean, excuse me, Moses writes an entire book, and he doesn't mention his wife, but very, very little. But here's an interesting aspect about this. She's angry with Moses. She's upset with Moses. Moses hasn't done something that he should have done. And now she comes to him and she's angry. She's actually bitter. Moses is getting ready to go out and, and to lead thousands and thousands of families. He's getting ready to go out and to lead them out of, of Egypt and lead them into the promised land, hopefully. And he's getting ready to do all of that and he's still got some unfinished business at home. There are things that he's not taking care of at home that he ought to have done. And guess who's mad at him? This is a lot different than not taking out the trash, guys. This is a serious offense that Moses has done. And guess what? Zipporah knows about it. Now, how we know that Zipporah knew this, it's hard to say. But God meets there and he's about to kill Moses and Zipporah realizes, she understands, she knows, maybe it's womanly intuition, I don't know. But she knows something, something bad is about to happen, and she knows why. And rather than go and submit to her husband and say, listen, we need to care for this, we need to do this, what does she do? She goes over and she takes care of the problem and circumcises the young child. She throws then the skin at his feet and says, you're a, you're a bloody husband to me. At this point, from this point forward, we, we hear very, very little about Zipporah. We're told in chapter 18 that Moses sent her and the boys back to Midian. And then we don't, they don't show back up until after the exodus when Jethro brings them back. And then from that point on, her name is not written again. Submission to the Father and obedience to Him will mark you as a believer. The harsh reality is that when you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are called to do some very unpopular things. Sometimes your spouse may not understand them. Sometimes your family may not understand them. Sometimes even your, your children will not understand them. But I tell you, there cannot be a more 
helpful, a more beneficial thing in your life than to have husband and wife both working and serving and loving the Lord Jesus Christ, having devotions together, praying together, seeking one another's help and support. One of the greatest things that you can have in this life is to have a loving and a devoted spouse that encourages you in your ministry, that helps your ministry. I tell you this one very thing. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have a husband or you have a wife that loves the Lord, then you tell them, thank you for loving Jesus. Thank you for loving Jesus. Husbands, let me ask you this. As as the leader of your home, is submission to the Father important to you? Let's not forget that submission is not for just the wife. Submission is to the husband. He submits to the father. And I I know it may not be politically correct to speak about ladies submitting to their husbands, but don't get too caught up in that. Husbands, we've got a, a responsibility to our wives to care for them and to love to them. Submission to them is just saying, all right, I'll I'll let you take care of me. It's a beautiful relationship. It's a wonderful thing that God put together. Someone once said that uh, what God means by the woman submitting to the husband is that she ducks when God hits. (laughs) I don't know. You can just dissect that the way you want. But realize that submission to the Father is worth more than the support of your family. Sometimes it's difficult. But it has to be done. Probably most of us understand and know that seatbelts are a little bit of a hassle. They're a little bit of a nuisance. Um, Maybe you bother to buckle up, or maybe you don't. I hope you do. But it's a problem that uh, our communities face, getting people to buckle up, to buckle their seatbelts. One gentleman by the name of uh, Ivan Sageddin, he took it to extreme. He had been arrested, not arrested, but he had been ticketed 32 times. (laughs) 32 times for not wearing his seatbelt. Cost him a lot of money. And so you know what Ivan decided to do? Rather than to start buckling up after that 30-second ticket, what he decided to do was to go home and to fashion himself a, a device that he could hang over his shoulder that looked like he was buckled in. Went through all the problems of making sure that he could get that harness around, make it look like so that when a cop passed by, and, and drove by or saw him in the car, looks like he was wearing a seatbelt. Went through all of that. Well, things went well. He didn't get any more tickets. The problem was he was in a head-on collision, and he died. Here's what the coroner wrote. Though his car was fitted with seatbelts, an extra belt with a long strap had been knotted above the seatbelt on the driver's side, providing a belt to simply sit over the driver's shoulder. You know what, maybe obeying God is a hassle to you. Maybe obeying God is a nuisance to you. And probably what you're doing is just trying to fashion something on the outside to make sure that everyone that passes by thinks that guy's okay. That gal's in good shape for the Lord. Nothing's wrong with their life. Everything looks good. On the outside. I wonder how many are in here today that are living a life fashioning good works, good deeds, trying to cover up the real root of our heart, which is a disobedient heart to God. Get your life in order today. It's time to make plans to get, get right with Jesus. Obedience to God is worth more than your family's praise. It is worth more than your pastor's praise. It is worth more than anything you could get from the outside. When you get praise from the Heavenly Father, it's greater than anything else you could ever get. The third thing that this passage teaches us is that the mark of death is necessary for eternal life. Circumcision is the original sign of a blood covenant between God and His people. And now this child has been put under this blood covenant in a very nasty and ugly scene God's covenant agreement is passed on to this child you see the world doesn't like the idea of blood I understand that I'm involved in that every day of my life 
The world doesn't understand what it is to be, to, to have sacrifice, to make sacrifice, to have to require a, a sacrifice. Many will say, you mean there is a God that requires a, a blood sacrifice? The whole idea is repulsive to the world. It's repulsive to them that there, there has to be blood. There has to be this pouring out, this spilling of blood. But I want you to remember something too. Go back and think about Zipporah was angry. She was upset that she had to do this. Moses failed to do his obligation. And Zipporah, she ended up doing it, although she didn't submit to Moses. Even though she goes out and does it, she's angry. She's bitter. She doesn't like the blood. She actually then just takes the skin and, and throws it over at Moses. She doesn't like the blood covenant either. And if Zipporah doesn't like the circumcision covenant, I wonder what she would ever think about the Passover. I wonder what she would think about the beloved Savior that hung on the cross and poured his blood. Listen, friends, it's a lesson of blood. It has to be the blood. I'm convinced of one thing. The blood must be preached. It must be preached and it must be believed. Any other way that you try to fashion yourself or try to get yourself into heaven, it will not work unless you come by the blood. If we deny the blood, we're denying sin. When we deny sin, we forfeit the cleansing power of repentance when we forego the necessity for repentance, then salvation is lost and universalism flourishes. It is the blood. We have the mark of death on our life. Since Adam, all died. We're in that lineage. We have the mark of death applied to us. And our only hope is the blood relationship with Jesus. One of my favorite hymns, it's entitled, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood by William Cowper. It goes like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. All sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced that day to see that fountain. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ever since by faith I saw the strength thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. Lord, I believe. Thou hast prepared, unworthy though I be, for me a blood-bought free reward, a golden heart for me. It's by the blood. It's the blood. It's not through our works. It's the blood. And when we fail in obedience to this blood relationship, then God threatens our very existence. The problems that we face in our churches today, we may talk about them being stylistic. We may talk about them being financial. But I just believe this. When God's people get back to obeying God, our problems will minimize. That's the reality of it. You're, you're familiar, I'm sure, in the Bible where it talks about two prodigals. The other are two. The one that stayed and the one that strayed. We're mostly familiar with the one that strayed and went out and done his own thing, lived righteous, righteously. But what about the one that stayed? His heart wasn't right either, was it? You go back to the text and you look at it, he was complaining to the father. Especially when the one returned back, he was the biggest complainer. He says, listen, you're doing all these great things, and I have stayed here. I have worked for you the whole time. I've done all this stuff, and now you're giving him all these things? Now you're blessing him? Now you're hugging him? And look, I have worked here all the time, and you haven't done that for me. Well, if that isn't a picture of the modern-day church, I don't know what is. 
We're looking up to God and saying, God, I've worked here in this church for you so many years. God, I have prayed for so many years over this. God, I have done this. I have done that. And we complain to God, even though we say we've worked in ministry, we've worked, we've sung in the choirs, we've fellowshiped, we've done all the things that we're supposed to do. We've got to remember that activity in the church doesn't equal obedience in the church. Obedience is complete surrender. And it requires our death to self in order to live for Christ. The story of some Fijian Christians. They decided they were going to take the gospel to New Guinea. They had to paddle their way across to the other island. The story goes and it reads and tells us that before they ever launched out, they built their own coffins. And inside those coffins, they put all of their belongings everything they own. And they set sail, leaving behind saying, we have died already to Christ. That's the way we should live. Every day of our life, we must die to self and live in obedience to Jesus. Do you really want revival in this land? Do you really want revival in your church? It must come through obedience. Nothing less will be sufficient to God. This text deals with a particular passage of Scripture that challenges us to obey. Week after week, I'm sure that your pastor, just like I do, preaches that there needs to be a commitment, a response. When the word is preached, when the word is read, you have an obligation to respond publicly, privately, but in some form and in some fashion. And, and we, we, we call people to make decisions. We call people to make it publicly. I happen to believe that God speaks to a lot more hearts than actually respond at the altar from week to week. Why is that? Because we have a disobedience problem. We think, oh, it's getting close to the 12 o'clock hour. I've got other things to do. Nobody wants to stay. Listen, people want to stay. God's, when God's people start pouring their hearts out and obeying God, things are going to happen. When we start obeying, nobody's going to want, worry about what time it is on the clock. Nobody's going to worry about what's going on afterwards. Living, we're, li we're, we're living in a generation to where we are losing the understanding of what real revival is. The great awakenings that occurred, occurred over a hundred years ago. We're growing up in a generation that has no understanding of what revival, genuine revival is. I don't know. I haven't really seen it or experienced it in my lifetime. And before I go to the grave, I want to see it. The only way to do that is we've got to get in obedience to God. Just last Saturday, May the 12th, a 43-year-old woman was walking on along the beach in San Clemente Beach, California, in Southern California. She was walking along, her children, like most of us do, uh, they have children, they go out and they pick up little rocks and seashells and those kind of things. And these girls, were, this, uh, the children were doing that and they brought them back to mom. Mom puts the rocks in her pocket, goes back to the hotel room, she's standing in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, her, her pants catch on fire. Spontaneous combustion is what they claimed it to be. I, I did some research and come to find out pistachio nuts can spontaneously combust. I didn't know that, but if you've got them in your kitchen, you may want to check them a little bit. Spontaneous combustion, just all of a sudden bursting out into flames. The sad part is, is that there are probably a lot of people, and maybe some of you here, that think that's the way that revival is going to occur. It's just going to spontaneously combust without doing anything, without having anything done. Do I agree? Do I understand that God can do and choose to do anything He wants to at any time He wants to with anyone that He wants to? Yes, I surrender to that. But I also say that God's Word says, if my people will do these things, there must be a level of obedience before we can experience genuine revival. I'm asking you today. I'm asking you for your obedience. Is your heart right where it should be? Are you living the life on Friday that you live it on Sunday? If you'll be honest, 
There isn't one person in here today that couldn't step it up just a little bit. We'll see who really wants to obey God in just a moment. If you want revival to occur, it's going to require a lesson in obedience. That obedience comes to this point right now. At this altar, in prayer, by yourself, or your husband or your wife, maybe even your family, maybe with one of your pastors. Maybe there's a level of forgiveness that you need to, to seek from God that you haven't. You've been hiding it. It's time to get right with Jesus. Let's obey God. In this very moment, let's obey him. Would you pray with me? My Lord and my God, oh dear Lord, would you forgive us of our trespasses and our sins? Father, I pray that you would spare our sinful and disobedient lives. May your sweet, sweet mercy rest upon our very lives and our very beings. And Father, I pray that this morning that you will thrust your will upon us, O oh Lord. Father, would you send your Holy Spirit to bring us into submission. Father, my prayer is that every born-again believer that has been bought and purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that they will flood this altar with commitment. They will flood this altar with commitment to obedience. Thy will be done in this place today. May you reign superior in all of our hearts and in all of our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. If you would this morning, go ahead and stand. Let's sing a hymn together. I know you need to make a decision. God has spoken to you. He loves you. He wants to give you forgiveness. Forgiveness is available. I pray that you come right now.
blood of Jesus that was sacrificed on the cross, has His blood covered your sins? Has the blood of Jesus been applied to your life? I know it's not popular. I know it's not something that's common for us to talk about. But the reality is absolutely this. The blood must be applied. Not a superficial covering. Not just something that we can tack on, take on and take off from time to time. But the blood of Christ must have been applied to your life. Has it been applied? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, that blood has never been applied, then you do it on this verse. The greatest decision you will ever make. Come to know it, young and old. If God has spoken to your heart. I